So, what do you think this is? This is a worried mother-to-be, but in 2005, trying to figure out why her baby hasn't kicked or moved in the past half hour. What about this one? This is also a worried mother-to-be, but in 2017, trying to figure out why her baby hasn't kicked or moved in the past half hour. And you guessed it. This is your family doctor. He's trying to figure out why there's so many flu patients in his office today. And no, you're not alone. There are many, many people on the social network that are trying to address their health information needs. If I had to guess, half of you in this room probably have at least one active social network account. To be precise, there are 1.6 billion people active on Facebook every month. So remember, we're just 7.5 billion people around the world. That makes it one out of three people is active on a social network every month. From a social perspective, social networks facilitate exchange of information, collaboration, foster friendships. But from a computational perspective, they generate data, vast amounts of data, the so-called big data. Data is now the new oil. It's very, very valuable. But if it's not refined, it's not very useful. So we have traditionally been very good at understanding what we say and others say on social networks. We understand what our friends are posting on Facebook, what other people are saying on Twitter. But machines have been designed to be good at data crunching. They're not very good at understanding what we as humans say or what we're generating on social networks. My research is focused on helping machines make sense of this user-generated content created on social networks. This content includes health-related and medical-related information as well. So today I'm going to be presenting to you five seemingly unrelated studies at the intersection of social networks and health information. Towards the end of my talk, I'll try to piece together these five studies and try to paint this bigger picture of how social networks can potentially impact our health and medical-related behavior. So please bear with me until the end of the talk. The first study that I'd like to present is work published in 2015 in The Lancet. The objective of the study was to see whether it's possible to positively change people's health-related behavior. The researchers specifically wanted to see whether they can convince people to take multivitamin pills. So they tried three strategies. They gave some people randomly multivitamins. In a different strategy, they found people with the most social connections, people who have larger families or have more friends, and gave them multivitamins. And in the third strategy, they randomly selected some people and asked them to nominate a friend. And that nominated friend then received the multivitamin pills. The findings were quite amazing. The strategy where the nominated friend had received the multivitamins had the highest rate of multivitamin use. That's even higher than when you give the multivitamins to people who have the most number of social connections. So the takeaway lesson from this is that social interaction, such as recommendations and suggestions by our close social friends, have high impact on our behavioral decisions. Even decisions that impact our personal well-being and health. The second study that I'd like to tell you about is on measles outbreak. Some of you may remember in 2013, 
there was a measles outbreak in the Netherlands because a group of people decided not to do vaccination because of religious reasons. Now, regardless of whether vaccination has any impact on controlling, vac on controlling measles or not, a group of researchers looked at the content that was produced on social networks about the measles outbreak. They specifically looked at three types of information. They looked at the number of tweets that were posted about the measles outbreak. They looked at the number of online news articles published by news outlets about the measles outbreak. They also had access to the actual number of reported cases of measles. And what they found was very, very interesting. They found that the total number of tweets that were posted at each given time was highly related to the number of news articles published on that topic. So if the total number of news articles on measles outbreak went up, the total number of tweets went up as well. If the number of news articles went down, the number of tweets also went down. But in contrast, they couldn't find a similar pattern and a relationship between the number of tweets and the actual cases of measles. In other words, even if the total number of reported cases of measles went up, that didn't necessarily mean that the total number of tweets would also go up. In other words, this points to the public opinion function of social network as opposed to a disease detection function. Users on social networks are highly influenced by what news outlets are telling them about health issues, as opposed to be influenced by actual measured metrics of health authorities. Interestingly enough, another group of researchers looked at the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. They specifically looked at the links that were shared on Twitter about this topic. What they found was that over 55% of the links shared about H1N1 pandemic on Twitter were linking to articles published by news outlets, as opposed to only less than 5% of those links pointing to content generated by health authorities. So this reinforces the agenda-setting role of news outlets even when it comes to issues of health. So media might not determine what people think about health issues, but they do in fact determine what people think about. So the takeaway lesson from this is that users on social network, even when it comes to their important personal well-being and health, are highly influenced by online news outlets as opposed to being informed by health authorities. So we all know that people have different opinions about different health issues in the real world. Now, researchers in 2012 wanted to see whether there's an actual reflection of that difference also on social networks. The reason this is important is because it can help health authorities determine if there are health misconceptions within the community and try to address it. So why they did was they created these health probe statements. They had three types of probe statements. Medically accurate probe statements, like chemotherapy treats breast cancer. Medically inaccurate statements, such as coffee causes diabetes, and debatable statements, such as overeating causes memory loss. When they looked at social networks, what they found was that the majority of people, 80% of them, had a correct understanding of true medical facts. But unfortunately, majority of people to be more accurate, 79% and 75% did not understand incorrect medical facts. In other words, they actually thought that incorrect medical facts were correct. So the takeaway lesson from this 
is we are faced with huge amounts of health and medical related information online. Some of them are accurate, some of them are not. But regardless of their accuracy and validity and trustworthiness, all of this information is asserted with certainty. So as users of social network, we can't really discern between what is correct and what is not. Now, the other issue that we face on a daily basis is the issue of drug abuse and drug overdose. To give you some context, in 2013 and in North America alone, there were close to 44,000 cases of drug overdose death. Half of these were attributable to prescription medication, drugs like opioids and benzodiazepines. So a group of researchers set out to see this reckless behavior in the real world, is it also reflected on the social network or not? What they found was with regards to drugs that have the so-called desirable side effects, such as weight loss, calming effects, heroin-like effects, that a majority of the mentions of these drugs in a lot of cases, point to mentions of drug abuse. More specifically, for a drug such as Adoral, which has a side effect of weight loss, 22% of all the mentions of this drug on Twitter are self-reported cases of drug abuse. The more unfortunate fact is that it's not only limited to self-reporting the drug abuse. There are a lot of cases of encouragement trying to get others to also try medication, drug, medication for side effects. Now, the takeaway from lesson from this is that not only we're faced with huge amount of incorrect medical information on social network, it is very likely that we will also encounter reports of drug abuse and encouragement from the social network users to engage in this reckless behavior. So I want my final study to be on a more positive note. Many of you may have heard of online patient social networks, such as patients like me. What these platforms do is they facilitate exchange of information between patients. Studies have shown that patients who engage in these social networks have a higher perceived quality of life. So in one specific study that looked at patients on patients like me and looked at specifically epilepsy patients, what they found was the 45% of the participants in the study reported that having joined the social network platform, they had a higher quality of life. 18% of these people said, as a result of joining the social network platform, they had to visit the emergency room fewer times. This can be partially explained by the fact that a third of the people who were in the study did not have anyone to interact with or talk to about their disease in the real life. Two-thirds of these people later reported that by joining the social network, they had at least found one person to bond with. Now, the takeaway lesson from this is that engaging in these platforms, even if they're virtual online social networks, can lead to perceived quality of life for patients. So now let me piece together these five studies and try to paint this bigger picture of how social networks can impact our health perceptions and medical-related behavior. So we know social network is a great place to find information about a variety of health issues. But not all of that information is accurate, reliable, or trustworthy. 
a lot of in that information is influenced by online news outlets as opposed to trusted health authorities. A lot of this information contains cases of self-reported drug abuse or cases encouraging you to engage in similar behavior. If you're this college student and you're late with your assignment, it's very likely that you will find someone on Facebook or on Twitter saying they'd use this drug to stay up late and hand in the assignment. And because it's a social network, and we tend to trust our social connections, it's very likely, at least at a subconscious level, that we are influenced by the information we see on the social network. So we have to constantly remind ourselves that not all health and medical information that we see on a social network is trustworthy and reliable. A social network is just a communication medium. It's there to facilitate exchange of information. It does not guarantee the validity of the information that you get. Think of it as your phone. We don't believe or take for granted whatever we hear on the phone. So why should we do the same on a social network? So data analytics research has started looking at ways in which health and medical related information on social networks can be validated, verified, and tested. But that technology in itself is in the start of its way. So I say to you, as I say to myself and my family and my friends, please, if you have a health concern, first talk to your doctor, or at least talk to a trusted health source before you engage in social network therapy. Thank you very much.